video, I'll be introducing and proving the Euler-Lagrange equations. Okay, let's start off with the supposed arc length, which is going to be the integral from 0 to 1 of the square root of 1 plus f prime of x squared dx. Probably seen something like this before, probably a little derivation of it, and it just gives you the distance that this function traverses. We could generalize this to s of f equals the integral from 0 to 1 of some l, a function that takes an x, f of x, and f prime of x, dx, right? And we could try to minimize these, right? So for example, for this first one, we could have f of x equals ax plus b one. Well, you might know from like some basic things that a line is the shortest distance between two points because any other curve like sort of goes like that or whatever. But how, how do I rigorously prove it? And so what we use is the Euler-Lagrange equations. What you have to do is you have to solve this equation. This is the Euler-Lagrange equation. And if you do that, this will give extrema. Okay, this gives you things that extremizes S. Okay, so where do we start in proving this? I'll start as I'll say, let eta be a smooth function such that eta of 0 equals eta of 1 is equal to 0. Okay. Um, and let the variation of f of degree epsilon, I'll just abbreviate this g epsilon, it's going to be f plus epsilon times eta. Okay, so the intuition here is that we're just going to have some function right here, and we're just going to perturb it up a little bit, right? Just a tiny bit, right? It's going to perturb it a little bit, and we're going to see how the distance compares. Okay, now if the distance doesn't change that much, that's good. That's what we want. That's minimizing it, right? Because if you imagine, we have a curve right here. It's minimum right there has very small changing things around it, right? And so what we want to do is analyze these little perturbations, and this will give us our answer, okay? It's nice and simple. We're just taking a variation of some order epsilon. And we will say that s epsilon is simply going to be equal to the integral from 0 to 1 of l epsilon. Okay, what do I mean by this? Well, I'm just using easier notation than writing out this. Just easier way to write out all that. We'll just substitute it like that. Okay, so um, now let's take the total derivative in respect to epsilon of this. The intuition here is that if I have a function, and I look at all of those little perturbations, right, and I look at those series of functions, right, taking the partial deriv uh, taking the derivative in respect to epsilon, really is just looking at the changes in these curves, not the overall change. And if I want my function to in fact B minimum or maximum, this change along all these functions has to minimize it. It has to get really small because in a minimum, the derivative, when you change the variable, has to be equal to zero. So this right here 
has to be equal to zero, and then you have it. Okay, this is going to be equal to the total derivative in respect to epsilon of my integral of z zero to one of L epsilon dx, right, which is equal to the integral from zero to one of the total derivative in respect to epsilon of L epsilon dx. And how do I evaluate that? Okay. And this is what the majority of this video is just going to be doing, is evaluating that. From the definition of total derivative, this is just simply equal to partial x, partial epsilon, times partial L epsilon, partial x, plus partial, and then we're going to do um, the other component, g epsilon, partial epsilon, times partial L epsilon, partial g epsilon, and then plus partial g epsilon prime partial epsilon times partial l epsilon partial g epsilon prime. Okay, and remember that g epsilon is equal to f plus epsilon eta. Okay, so now we're going to evaluate this. x has no nothing there, so that's just zero. Okay, the next one is going to be this one right here. In respect to epsilon, the only thing that has epsilon out here is eta. So that's just eta. Eta times partial L epsilon, partial G epsilon. And then the other one is simply going to be where we derive this. The only one there that's with an epsilon is eta prime. So we just put eta prime partial L epsilon partial G epsilon prime. Cool. So now we have that. Now let's plug this back in. S, um, the total derivative in respect to epsilon of S epsilon is simply going to be the integral from 0 to 1 of, and we're going to have eta times partial L epsilon over partial G epsilon plus eta prime times partial L epsilon over partial G epsilon prime dx. Okay, that's pretty, pretty simple, I, I suppose. Now, what I'll do is I'll simplify this integral. So I'm going to Get a little border here. This is going to be equal to the integral from 0 to 1 of eta times partial L epsilon, partial G epsilon, dx, plus the integral from 0 to 1, eta prime times partial L epsilon, partial G epsilon, dx. Now, right there, eta prime, I want to get rid of it. We only want eta in here. What's no one wants eta prime? Get out of here. <laughs> okay, so what we'll do is we'll integrate by parts, right? So um u is going to have to be equal to this one, partial L epsilon, partial G epsilon, and dv is gonna have to be equal to this one so that it gets reduced down when you integrate it. And so in total, we get here the integral from 0 to 1 of eta times partial L epsilon, partial G epsilon, dx, plus, then we're going to have V, which is just eta, u, which is this. We're evaluating that uh, from 0 to 1. And then we're subtracting off of that the integral from 0 to 1 of v du, which is going to be derivative in respect to x of the partial of L epsilon in respect to g epsilon prime, prime there, dx. Okay, this right here, eta at 0 and 1 is 0. So this entire thing goes to 0. And so in finale, we get the integral from 0 to 1 of eta, I'm factoring it out here, of partial L epsilon, 
partial g epsilon minus d on dx partial l epsilon partial g epsilon prime dx, right? But you can recognize this just from the equations. Okay, so now what I'll do is I'll evaluate this at epsilon equals zero. And so all of these epsilons go to zeros, all these g epsilons go to f's, and we're just left with this. And because this is, we want it to be an extrema, right? We want that to go to zero. And but the only way for this to happen for arbitrary eta, the only way for that to happen is for this to be equal to zero. And that's it. I'm now going to prove that the linear equation works well with um, the arc length, right? Okay, what, what are the equations again? Partial L, partial F, minus V, DX, partial L, partial F prime, equals zero. There's no F in here. Get that out of there. We can make that a plus because it's equal to zero. And so we just have to check, when is this equal to zero? Okay. This is going to be D on DX. Partial derivative of this in respect to F prime. Okay, that's going to be 1 over 2 the square root of 1 plus f prime of x squared. Okay, and then we multiply that by the derivative of the inside, which is 2 f prime of x. Right, those cancel each other out. We're left with that. Okay, so then from there, we set that equal to 0. The only way for this to be equal to 0, this derivative, is for this all this inside to be equal to the constant, right? Now let's solve for that constant. The f prime of x squared over 1 plus f prime of x squared. Okay, so let's add 1 subtract 1, that cancels out with that, I get c squared equals 1 minus 1 over 1 plus f prime of x squared, right? Okay, let's subtract that 1 off, minus 1. Let's uh, negate it and subtract that 1 off, so that's going to be 1 minus c squared. That's going to be 1 over 1 plus f prime of x squared, right? So that's going to be 1 over 1 minus c squared has to be equal to 1 plus f prime of x squared. Subtract that 1, um, f prime of x squared is going to have to be equal to c squared on the top, 1 minus c squared on the bottom, f prime of x equals c over the square root of 1 minus c squared, f prime is just equal to a constant a, f of x is going to be some ax plus b. It's crazy, but it works.